Here is the Love Seeker Trilogy by Barbara Ann Quinlan, Found, Lost, and Recovered. Hope you enjoy this short reading from Found. Chapter 1. I see myself walking back up Théophile Gautier in the 16th arrondissement district of Paris, just as the evening begins to draw the trees' shadows upon the sidewalk. Ahead, though still in the distance, a man in an elegant overcoat is walking towards me. The light obscures his face, though there is something familiar about his gait. As he continues in his self-assured stride, I sense an awakening within me and quicken my pace directly towards him. Can it be, I wonder? His face is coming into view, and it is clear now that he sees me too. Strangely, I can feel the apprehension building inside him, the doubt, the disbelief, until finally there I am, standing directly in his path, face to face, eye to eye. Mais, qu'est-ce que tu veux? he blurts out before the shock can set in, and the awe of love washes over his eyes, widening them. How long has it been since he first asked me that question? My answer had given birth to our relationship. I turned 21 in Paris alone. Now I recall that was the night we met. I had only just arrived a few days before, after a harrowing night in Amsterdam, where I was forcibly ejected from the only youth hostel I'd ever attempted to stay in. I was never much for curfews. A communal room full of bunk beds was not my style. The hostel manager caught my friend Robin and me in a bathroom stall where we were trying to smoke hash oil out of a small glass bottle. Suddenly we were thrown down the outside stairs, my 80 pound knapsack tumbling after us as he screamed, lesbians. I wasn't sure if we were being thrown out for breaking curfew, smoking hash oil, or because he thought we were lesbians, whatever. It was Amsterdam, for God's sake. My first tiny room in Paris was in the servants' quarters on the top floor at 1 Rue de l'Ambre. There was no window. A bare light bulb hung from the ceiling. A shower head was affixed in the corner with a plastic curtain to draw around it and a drain on the floor. The bed was a small mattress, also on the floor. Though I had never seen a room like this, nor imagined such a lodging, the barren simplicity somehow made me feel stronger. Having quickly realized I would need to work to stay afloat in Paris, I soon took a job as an au pair to a young boy named Fabrice, who lived with his father. On my birthday, I went down the street to the nearest cafe and ordered a glass of champagne. I toasted myself and thought how wonderful it was to be alone, where no one knew me and I could perhaps see who I really was outside the confines of others' concepts. The fact that I didn't yet speak enough French to comprehend the chattering of those around me was also very comforting. I had decided to treat myself to an evening in the Latin Quarter, and so finishing my drink, I headed for the Metro. I first went into the famous bookstore Shakespeare and Company, where I found myself enthralled by the lingering vibrations of the great artists and poets who had hung out there. Picasso, Braque, Baudelaire, Verlaine, and my beloved Rambo. I climbed the stairs to the small apartment where writers of every sort had often been allowed to take shelter for a time and rested a while in a large, ancient, overstuffed wingback chair. Then I made my way back downstairs and out, around the corner, to the cloister. The front was all French window panes, neatly wood framed. I was surprised to find that the inside was done in Tudor style. I sat at the bar alone and ordered a glass of white wine. Quickly, after the first few sips, I saw him. His shoulder length hair was clean, though slightly unkempt and he wore an olive green army fatigue jacket. I knew immediately he felt me by the way he purposely avoided looking at me as he sauntered over to an apparently arbitrary seat at a table near the bar. He ordered a drink, continuing to pretend I wasn't there as I watched him with great intent out of the corner of my eye. Then I looked away entirely and gave my full attention to feeling him as if within me. I had learned in my experimental theater classes how to send a message without speaking or gesturing in any way how to direct a feeling to touch someone across a room and to manipulate energy as well as the color of its radiance. So I decided to practice. I chose the color red and imagined that the energy was flowing down from my hips to the floor and running along like a stream to his feet and up his legs. I know he felt it. I felt him try to shake it off and was surprised when he got up abruptly and walked out the door. Of course I followed him out and down the sidewalk, staying 10 or 20 paces behind, walking through the streets, 
and into a darkened alley. When even then I did not leave, he finally turned around and asked, Mais, qu'est-ce que tu veux? But what do you want? Je veux toi. I want you, I retorted boldly. He turned away, shrugging his shoulders as if to say, So come along if you cannot be dissuaded. I quickened my step to catch up and walk beside him. The first recognition was how our gait matched, pace by pace, step by swift step. We began our march through the night streets of Paris in perfect unison. After several blocks in silence, he casually asked, So what are you doing here in Paris? His voice was deep and rich, its warm tones slipping through his soft accent, belied the disinterest he still attempted to feign. I'm here to learn French, he rolled his eyes. I'm on my way to Grotowski's Theater Laboratorium in Warsaw, Poland. The stipulation is that all participants speak French. Thank God he's not insisting on Polish. Now he was intrigued. And so it was that Jean and I began our night walk throughout Paris. Jean took me on an amazing tour that would continue until dawn. He knew Paris like a kid knows his own backyard, and Paris knew him. He led me into the corners and alcoves where the poor hid from Les Fliques, rather than be herded up and hauled outside Paris each night, as they were, to prevent them from sleeping in the streets. We came upon a group gathered around several crates of grapes. Jean whispered, they've stolen these, and we continued to approach them. He asked quietly, Are you afraid? No, I responded simply, already knowing I would follow him anywhere. We joined them and they shared their grapes with us. They knew Jean. This was not the first time they'd met him. He was welcomed and trusted. We had our fill and moved on. I asked a little about his family. He was an only child, given up by his mother at birth. She tossed him into the arms of his father, who took him to be raised by his grandmother. He revealed it all without a single trace of emotion. We continued on tirelessly through the streets. It was already the best adventure I'd had in some time. With my insatiable passion for life, I was enthralled by the magic of our meeting and the energy it filled us with. As dawn approached, he asked me where I live and began leading us towards my place. I took him up to my tiny, humble servant's quarters and grabbed my camera. I was about to take a picture of him when he said, come and led me out of my room and up to the rooftop. Now all of Paris was laid at my feet, and he photographed me as I skipped and danced in the sweet dawn's light. Then abruptly he announced it was time for him to leave. I went with him back down to the street, kissed him on both cheeks, embraced him warmly, and looking into his eyes asked, where will I find you again? He puffed up his cheeks, blew the air out, shook his head, shrugged his shoulders, and said, Shippa. I don't know when. I let him go without another word. Somehow I slept, and upon wakening, I realized I had to see him again. But how? Oddly enough, that day Fabrizio's father made a pass at me, and I resigned. This, of course, meant that I'd have to find a new position, and hence, new lodgings. Now how would Jean find me? Or I him? <laughs>